Welcome to The Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who try various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is part six in our special series of interviews with Mark Hunneman, exorcist and author of Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. We've been discussing EVPs and the fact that many people today are using EVP uh, recording equipment to try to contact uh, dead people, angels, spirit guys and so on so this and final part i wanted to um share my own experience of this and i mean my own experience of this as a christian and i know that's going to shock many people um but i myself going back some years now was involved in a christian um group of people who believed we could talk to our own angels. We didn't use EVPs, but um, we certainly felt we were in touch with angels. And I would love to share that because I realise it's very popular nowadays within Christians worldwide, actually. It seems to have been um, one of the recent fads in recent years, and I'd love to share it with you. But but first of all, um, I have a quote to read, and this is from ex-Satanist Jeff Harshbarger. He said, be careful as you gather knowledge. Satan would still tempt you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil rather than the tree of life. That is Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's really a good little quote there. So, Mark, welcome back again to the show. Hey, thank you, Laura. Uh, it's, it's a real privilege and as I've said before, this is the highlight of my 10 years in, in, involved in, in um, studying and helping people in this area. So it's great to be with you. Thank you from sunny North Carolina, USA. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, you You don't know how humbling it is for me to hear that. I, I'm, I'm almost in disbelief that you would even say that. But it, actually, I feel the same because I've read your book and I know how uh, close to your heart this whole topic is. Um, yeah. And so, which it is to me too, yeah. so I do understand your, your passion for sharing the truth with people and seeing people being set free. Um, so, yeah, it's actually sunny here in Scotland today. Yay! <laughs> that's right here. I know. Yeah, Lord, that's great. Glad to hear it. <laughs> and, I mean, it's September, so wow. You know, it's really, really actually quite nice and even looks a bit summery. So, that's lovely. Um. So, Mark, really, you know, continue to what you were going to share this time about um, spiritism and angel communication and so on. Do uh, you just want me to talk about, uh, you know, not, uh, the dangers of angel communication? I'm sorry, Lord. Um, my brain is a little fuzzy. <laughs> yeah, mine's is a bit fuzzy today as well. I think it's one of those days. Um, actually, you had mentioned um, before offline about the, the, the reigns of kings, you know, the Jewish kings down through the Old Testament in particular, and right. um, really that they were designated as being good or bad, depending on how they dealt with spiritism in all its various forms. And I thought that was such a valid point because yeah. that, that's how important yeah. spirit communication is to God. Okay, okay. let me, thank you for uh Specify it now. I, now I got my my little uh, my little brain focused. Um, yeah, it hit me hard. Uh, I've I've studied the Bible um, for well over forty years now, and uh, second, you know, the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles, as most people know, is 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 a history book. It's a history of the kings of the southern and northern kingdoms. You know, at first they were united under Solomon and David, and then and tragically shortly afterward you had Judah, and then you had Israel in the northern kingdom. And uh, so what you have in the book of both Kings and Chronicles is 
a a summary of of all these kings from the beginning to the end and from Saul onwards and they're all they're all designated as either being good or bad and it hit me recently that a, if not the major criterion by which they were judged as being good or bad, is how they dealt with the occult in general and spiritism in particular. Wow. And I thought, wow, that you know, that, amazing. yeah, that, I mean, that's really significant because the king was supposed to be the leader, the embodiment of covenant fidelity. And the covenant law, the co- the constitution of the covenant is is um, is the Pentateuch in general, and in particular the Book of Deuteronomy. And of course, that's why Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy three times when he's being tempted by Satan. But the the king was supposed to follow the king's law, mm-hmm. and so particularly when we have in Deuteronomy eighteen the clearest delineation of from God himself as to what he loves and what he hates, and in particular, in this case, what he hates. Because in Deuteronomy 18, you have a, first of all, you have communication that is for, forbidden, and then the second part of Deuteronomy 18 is the speaking of the legitimate form of communication, and that is via the prophet, starting with Moses. So, both of those obviously are very important, but in that Deuteronomy 18, as we talked about many times, is, is you have this list for everything from a child sacrifice to mediums to necromancy to try, you know, spiritism, trying to communicate with the dead. Mm-hmm. So a thousand years later, we have, I mean, down through the ages, um, Moses was around 1500, you know, roughly BC. Uh, and then we get to Josiah, uh, who was about a thousand years later, and we see the continuity of the focus on the importance of the of the law of God in judging whether or not the kings were good or bad. And I just wanted to um, read about Josiah, who Mm -hmm. actually the Bible speaks of as being the greatest king in Israel's history. Mm -hmm. We normally think of of David or Solomon, but in in, in a very real sense, Josiah is is, um, picked out as being the one who was the most faithful. Mm -hmm. And we... When you read these long sections on Josiah, it just fills my soul with, um, I guess, this passion because he, he was so focused on demolishing the things that he knew were odious to the God, the God that he loved. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to read to you, if I, yes, if I might, from Second Kings. Yes. It says... Uh, 2 Kings 23, starting at verse 21. And the king commanded all the people, keep, this is Josiah, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. Now that, that would have been Deuteronomy, y'all. Mm-hmm. For no such Passover had been kept since the day of the judges who judged Israel or during all the days of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. So there you have the positive the keeping of the Passover. But here it goes. Moreover, and this is summarizing Josiah as, as, as one of, if not the greatest kings uh, ever, Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And again, that was the book of Deuteronomy. Before him, listen to this, before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Nor did any like him arise after him. Well, and notice that he's the greatest king mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. And it's because of his faithfulness. And But notice that what is prefaced to that 
was because of his, not just out of a kind of a um, iconoclastic fervor, but out of a deep love for God, it says that he, he therefore, if you, if you love God, you will love what he loves and hate what he hates. And so it explicitly brings mm-hmm. out how he put away the mediums and, that, and even the household gods, um, Laura, those were used, mm-hmm. whether they were the little tiny ones or life-size ones, those were most frequently used to communicate with, uh, or alleged, with, with uh, deceased ancestors and mm-hmm. relatives and so forth. So this whole thing is is focused in on what we would today call spiritism. Mm-hmm. And it's just a very classic example of how this great king, the summary of his wonderful reign uh, can be summarized in terms of, of how passionately he dealt with getting rid of spiritism uh, along with his celebration of Passover on a positive note. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very, very instructive because this is a thousand years after Moses, about a thousand years after Moses has given it. And, you know, so we know that God's word has a transcultural and transgenerational authority mm-hmm. up until today. The moral law of God, as we talked about in one of our previous sessions, that is as much in as much authoritative today as it was in the time of Josiah or Moses. So, mm-hmm. you know, if God sees that as pleasing and puts his stamp of approval on this man as loving him more than anybody, any king before or since, as manifested in part, in large measure, I should say, because of his passion towards spiritism, that's very instructive for us today, Laura, because spiritism in the last 30 years or so has just exploded. And so we're in the same context that he's in. And that's a call for us, if we love God, to have that same passion that Josiah had mm-hmm. as an expression of our love for the Lord. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, uh, this is all, is all relevant um, even to our topic of EVPs and, and, and attempting to contact angels and so on. And I think especially now, now today, because really worldwide we're seeing many Christians now um, believing they can contact their own angels and ex- yeah. expecting to do so, looking forward to doing so, but being eager to do so. Um, and even within... Um, healing and deliverance ministries where, where we would think perhaps yeah, yeah. perhaps they wouldn't do that because they would be perhaps a little bit more aware of new age deceptions and so on um, but yeah. it, it seems to have entered there too um, ministries for example that deal with that help people heal people from trauma or SRA survivors it seems to have creeped in there too and has, yeah. and has been for recent uh, recent years and you know basically that's how I fell into this myself which I'll, I'll describe shortly but you know I was thinking that really um, when we consider all of these all of these things that we've discussed so far really I think um, Christians should perhaps take as a baseline assume that if they are contacted by a so-called angel, actual fact, take the baseline of assuming that it is a demon rather than working from the other other way around and assuming it's an angel of God and then maybe testing out to see if it's a demon. I think the baseline should be the other way and I know that sounds mistrusting, but I actually think that's far more consistent with the biblical pattern. Yes, it sure is. Because angel appearances were actually quite rare um, in the sense of through the Old Testament and the New. Yes, angels uh, did show up. I'm not discounting that. Yes, they. I believe they will uh, show up in the healing and deliverance ministry. But I think when they do so, we probably would be unaware of it because they don't want to announce themselves and take attention to themselves. So I think that right. um, overall that the pattern in the Bible was that their appearances were 
rare, whereas today our culture is, including in the Christian community, to expect angels, um, perhaps even on a, on a uh, quite frequent basis. Some, some Christians feel that they, they can expect to um, communicate with their angels daily. You know, yes. a, a daily, a, mm. to me, just kind of a sums up because that is not uh, their purpose and it's not what they did do um, throughout the accounts, th uh, you know, in the Bible. So... That's a I great point. You know, so I think it's almost become uh, trivial nowadays, whereas centuries ago, for example, um, Christians were, they seemed to be more uh, aware of God's, awesomeness and, and it was a humbling experience if an angel turned up they were often terrified you know yeah. when the bible when an angel turned up often the first thing the angel would say to the people is do not be afraid because right. it was a shocking experience albeit a, a holy one it was deeply profound um and i've noticed mm. that people when people have had an experience with an angel which i would consider to be more likely a real angel often that person will hardly be able to speak of it to anyone. They may keep it private for many years. They, it's so precious and so profound that they, they don't even want to refer to it. Um, they're often very stunned by the enormity of it all. Um, physically, they feel like their body may explode. You know, wow. they, they just hardly ever want to talk about it. Um, so I, I just think that this um, expecting to, to hear from our angels regularly is a warning sign in itself. Yeah, it is. I think, yeah, the term you used, um, sorry for interjecting, but you used a phrase earlier um, in another conversation, over-familiarity. And I thought that was a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, way of summarizing a lot of people's attitude towards angelic visitation and communication. Yeah, it is definitely it's becoming over familiar and, and with that over familiarity comes that that sense of irreverence even and uh, dare I say lack of respect and I know that sounds a shocking thing to say but we're human that's that's the way we, yeah. we can be. Um and again like like in, in centuries ago for example many people knew that, that fairies most of the time, fairies were evil. Fairies were wicked. Fairies um, caused havoc for people. Nowadays, it seems to have went the opposite way, where people mostly assume fairies are good. Um, you know, the analogy being, rather than accept something as good, actually look at it the other way and, and, and test it and say it's more likely this is actually a demon rather than a real angel. Um, and... You know, if I may interject this too, I think it's important that people see that that's not and would not be seen as a lack of faith on God's part. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're to follow his word and he tells us that we, we must be discerning because of the very nature of the spirit realm. And because of the job description of angels and the history that you outlined so well, they... They are frequently with us, but it's in a covert form, mm -hmm. in, in either invisible or they will em, embody themselves. Like it says in, in Hebrews, you know, uh, you may entertain angels unawares, but that's not them appearing to us in their glory and majesty. And like you said, which oftentimes or almost always results in a, a sense of undoing and just a deep sense of awe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there needs to be. There's a lack of discernment. I guess is what I'm driving at when it comes to angelic encounters, mm -hmm. and that's um, that's not only tragic but it's extremely dangerous. Yep, because we know the evil one, uh, the classic text. You know, angel of light. Mm -hmm. I think that you know it would seem that the angels are reluctant to appear to us in a tangible way. Um, when we need help, um, and and if, when they do, it's only if really, really necessary. Yeah, I, I, I know that to be the case. But, I mm -hmm. mean, they're, they're humble. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't want people to be drawn, fascinated by them, and they want people's focus to stay in God. Um, 
and through the Bible, they didn't tend to appear to the same person lots and lots and lots of times. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a few times in that person's whole life. Whereas this, um, what we have today, where, where even Christians are expected to have frequent conversations with their angel, it's just, you know, it's right. not, not consistent. It's not consistent with the Bible and the nature of angels. That isn't the way um, they, they work, basically, um, when you look at the Bible. Um, so I, I reckon that basically 99% of the time, if an angel appears to a Christian, it is actually a demon. And as you said, Amen. You know, yes. I don't believe that's a lack of faith or a lack of um, mistrust on my part or suspicion. I believe the angels will be with us. I'm not saying they're not. But if they're showing themselves to us and having a conversation, I would actually take the baseline. It is actually a demon rather than an angel. Um, and let me interject this as well. Um, you you may we're going to come to this real soon, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to say this real quickly. I, I just wrote a, a pretty lengthy blog, um, which I tend to do. <laughs> but anyway, the the main point that I make in my blog was had was basically asked the question why we should not initiate communication with angels. Mm -hmm. and the key word is initiate. If you look at communication, if in rare instance where an angel does communicate, it's always angelic initiation with the human being mm -hmm. sent by God. But what we're seeing today, what you're talking about is, is people initiating communication with their quote, uh, guardian angel or trying to reach, um, some specific angel that they become familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, when, when we look at the life of, of the apostles, we look at the life of Jesus, we look at the teaching and the epistles, and not once, not once from Genesis to Revelation is there an instance in which a godly person uh, attempted, initiated communication with an angel, not mm -hmm. once. And mm -hmm. we're told by Peter that not only the words of Jesus should instruct us, but also his life. Mm -hmm. You know, we're to, we're to mimic Jesus' life. And if they did not initiate communication with angels, who do we think we are today to initiate communication with angels? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, I mean, we're to take the biblical model as, as uh, uh, authoritative teaching. And so that speaks loudly and clearly to this issue. We must not initiate communication with angels because, in a sense, it's almost like astrology because we're looking to part of God's creation mm -hmm. for guidance and protection and, and speaking to them instead of looking to the creator for guidance and protection. Yeah, uh, so. absolutely. And even if a person says, well, I never initiated this at all. I have my, uh, I'm a born again Christian, you know, um, and I have this angel coming to me frequently or maybe just once a year or whatever, but I didn't initiate it. It just came itself. Either way, it's the same um, principle here. And for right. those who, who are, are talking to them more often, there is that over familiarity which I have witnessed myself because um, years, some years back when I was um, involved with um, a group of Christians in my own country, uh, lovely people by the way, I loved them to bits, really respected them, um, very godly people, yes they were. Um, you know, but that familiarity began to come in because they uh, began to feel that they were, um, they wouldn't say having communication with angels, they wouldn't use that term, but, but certainly receiving revelation from their angel um, regularly. And mm. But I, I noticed over time, now it, it bothered me from the very start, but I wasn't too sure, and I'll explain why in a minute, but... The, the overfamiliarity began to come when I heard, um, and I believe this was even, you know, uh, recorded at, at meetings in, in the church, so it would have been on CD. Anyone else could have heard it in the public domain. So I'm not trying to gossip here, but I did hear the leader say, for example, things like, oh, my angel came into the shower today when I was having a shower, so I just told him, get out of here just now, I'll talk to you later. Wow. Um, wow, wow, wow. A, another leader um, who said their angel liked to show up 
um, when he didn't know and, and move his cup of tea around in a friendly, uh, kind of a playful manner. Now, again, that to me sounds too over familiar for an angel to actually behave in such a way. Um, it, it, it sounds like a, a, a playful relationship, but dare I say, sounds more like a poltergeist type activity. And would an angel really come and visit you in the shower? A holy angel from God? I, I don't think so. But, you know, no. I, I am saying this out of love, uh, not out of judgment, because I have been involved with, 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 with these folks, and I was in that situation too. Uh, so yeah. I know how it can be, we can be tricked into, into these things. So I want to share that now with people, just what I experienced. Um, and it's a tremendously humbling thing to share because who, who likes to admit they've been deceived? Especially, I suppose, yeah. um, when you're in a ministry like mine, that, that I've come out of the new age. You know, I got saved out of all that type of stuff. So you might imagine, well, how on earth did, did Laura get deceived into that? But it just shows you, Mark, People can get deceived. So um, there's a little time yes. lag. There's a little time lag. None of, none of us are above that. Mm -hmm. There's a little time lag here. Sometimes when, when Mark speaks, it takes a few seconds to come through. We apologize for that. A uh, little delay there. So, yeah, basically, um, you know, I noticed about... Oh, about a year ago, I believe it was last October, October 2016, or thereabouts, um, a, a woman that um, has been on a few radio shows with me, Carolyn Hamlet, ex-Illuminati member, she had been involved with, she had met various Christians, various ministries who were into the healing and deliverance ministry and the prophetic ministry too, I think, um, I don't know a whole lot of detail about it all, but I remember her telling me at the time that, that she uh, at one point had went to receive ministry herself for obviously uh, healing and deliverance from her past, having been involved in Illuminati. And that one of the, the men who ministered to her uh, said that she had an angel um, called Edward or something like this and that he was there to heal her now I remember getting warning bells and sharing her concerns my concerns with her um, she did draw away from that group of people when she began to see um, that there were other sort of a strange things going on in the ministry that, that weren't, weren't quite right like so called astral projection so on and she wow. came away from it but it took her a little bit of time now that was a year ago I, I am coming out with this now even though it's been longer than a year ago with me. So you might say, well, why is that? Well, basically, when I first came out, I was so uh, beat up about what I had been deceived by and so horrified at all that I didn't even want to think about it for a long time, never mind talk about it. And then, of course, um, it the topic just didn't come up, if you like, um, until talking with you, and it came up. And I thought, why don't I share this with people? This is important. I'm so glad. Um, and I thought, you know, Carolyn had the courage and the guts to practically mention it right away. She went on her blog writing about it, and I thought, well, well what's holding me back? Now, I actually forgot as well. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I did. Um, when you're busy, you can forget things. So, But this sure. is the this is a ideal time to really share what happened with me. Yes, yeah, so basically, um, I um, started to, to go to some Christian meetings, um, you know, they were into healing, deliverance and, and prophecy and that, that was all, all wonderful. But then they began to say, you know, about angels and, and how you could partner with your angel, how you could cooperate with your angel, how, um, you know, if you did this, your angel would help you uh, in your Christian life. Now, straight away, as soon as I heard that said in a meeting, I immediately wanted to get up and leave instantly. I just felt, whoa. This is new age. I know these guys don't think it is, but it is really. I'm out of here. But I didn't. Um, I guess because I thought it was a room full of people I knew. It would be embarrassing to walk out and leave. So I stayed. Now, the thing about that is we do realise that, the, you know, the Bible says in, in the beginning, um, when you're faced with a deception, not always, but often, often you will get a warning sign. You will feel those warning bells. 
Um, but if you uh, ignore them, you begin to lose sensitivity to that. And that means you are open to the deception and God will allow you to be deceived if you um, go along with the experience and ignore what you know the Bible actually says. Um, so, so it's like bit by bit, you, you accept it a little bit more, you become more and more blind to it um, uh, and you become open to that uh, deception. Mm. And that's what happened to me. So basically, why? Because I trusted these leaders implicitly. Um, you want to trust your leaders. I, I believed yeah. that they were more clever than me. They had a better knowledge of the Bible than me. They were more spiritual than me. They were closer to God than me. And therefore, I, I respected them, I trusted them, and I simply just doubted my own self, doubted my own discernment, and thought I was maybe not reading the Bible properly, as it were, and that these guys had a truth that I had missed. I thought I was being too suspicious because of my New Age past, and so that's why I continued going. So what happened? Well, they had, um, you know, classes in how to... When I say communicate with angels, it was more a case of, it was an activation class, they would call it. It was more a case of, you know, let's all get together, close our eyes, pray, and ask for God to send us a, a picture in our mind's eye of our angel um, and begin to ask questions, i.e., what is the angel's name? What is its function? What is it doing in my life at this time? How can I cooperate with, with what the angel is doing uh, in my life and so on? Wow. So, again, I remember initially thinking, oh, my goodness, that's just new age visualization techniques. That's just really new age. But again, I stayed because I was confused and I thought I'd best just sit here and, and see what these guys are teaching. Um, thinking that it probably was demonic, but I wanted to know what, what they were up to, if you like, as well. But, you know, it, it did begin to seem real and I did begin to doubt myself so I kept going but I would hear of, of, of stories that, that they, they had heard from other people around the world other Christian groups for example that had claimed they were out somewhere and they found um, a bunch of their guardian angels all asleep so they shouted at their angels wakey wakey and ran away like a game <laughs> um, and I thought Really, that is the familiarity coming in here. We're, we're becoming irreverent with angels. You didn't see anyone in the Bible acting like that, uh, you know, if they found an angel. Plus, actually, I doubt angels even do sleep. Um, God doesn't sleep. Why should an angel need to sleep? And if an angel can sleep, then they, they have such serious business to do. We have really got no right in going waking them up. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, back to, to, to my experience, well, we were, I went to a class, the very first class, actually, that was a, more of an activation class, I meant to be a kind of a deeper level, um, and I went there now with, with these thoughts in my head, thinking this can't be right, and I was praying, asking God to show me uh, the truth, um, because he clearly was, and I was beginning to be coming out of it asked him to show me the truth. So I went to this class and it was an activation class. Close your eyes and ask God to send you a picture in your mind's eye of your angel. Well, we all did that. I did that and I instantly got the picture of, now this is just quite amazing. In the 1980s, there was a TV advert that advertised a cereal. Um, I think the, the cereal was Honey Puffs. And the character that was on the box and the TV advert was called the Honey Monster. Now, this was a lovable monster, a bit like a Muppet character. Um, big teddy bear, kind of a lovable, gentle giant of a monster. Um, but he was a monster. Well, that is the image I got in my mind's eye. Wow. The Honey Monster. So I'm, I'm seeing that in my mind's eye and I'm thinking, oh, Wow. I am out of here. There is no way that is an angel. It's so obviously ridiculous. So then um, the other one I got when I, uh, you know, did this exercise was a picture of the the court jester, you know, the fool, um, the clown. 
Wow. I saw him in my mind's eye. And I thought, oh, well, this is definitely not right. Um, there is no way this is an angel. You know, <laughs> the, the, this is so demonic. Satan is laughing at us. He's having a joke at my expense. He's humiliating people, um, sending angels into their shower or, or moving their teacups. You know, this is just not on. So when it was finished and we all got together and shared with each other what picture we saw in our head, I was so keen to hear what they would say about mine. And you know what? I was so disappointed. I was broken hearted for them because they all agreed um, that this was uh, this, these were angels and that it was just, you know, uh, the court jester angel was showing me that the angel had a sense of humour. It wanted me to have more fun in my life, for example. The honey monster was just an angel that was really sweet and fun. Uh, wow. Well... So I was broken hearted because I'd known these people for a few years. I loved these people, really fond of them. But I saw how deeply deceived they were, that even the leader uh, agreed with that interpretation of what I had saw. Uh, some of the others in the group saw kind of bizarre things too. I think mine was the most bizarre. And I reckon that's because God literally showed me those pictures as he was showing me. It is a court jester. You are being, it is the fool. You are being tricked. And, yeah. you know, the honey monster, well, hey, it might be harmless and fun, but at the end of the day, it's still a monster. And that, I think, sums up the whole, what are these angels? They might be fun, they might be sweet, but at the end of the day, they are still a demonic monster. They're not really an angel. So, you know, that, 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 was, that was my experience. And I left and I never went back. And I, I, I was broken hearted. I really, really was for the people because I loved them. Um, and I was also deeply traumatised by the fact I had been deceived. I, I was shocked. I was angry at myself. I was disgusted at myself. Um, and it was really a, a painful, painful time. I did go to a, a deliverance ministry and shared with them. And they had heard of this. They, they know that it's actually getting popular worldwide. They had heard of this. And yes, I got deliverance. I um, Because basically I had been, you know, opening myself to demons. So I got deliverance. I had demons cast out of me um, because of that um, experience when I repented of that. So, you know, I just wanted to share with people when, when I do these shows, it's not because I'm acting judgmental or, you know, wanting to say, I'm right and you're wrong, blah, blah. No, you know, some of it is because I've actually been through it myself um, and been really humbled by 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 what I've come through and what God has has actually brought me through. Uh, Lord, that's that's uh, that's touching. That's very powerful, more than anything I could ever say about it. Because you you've been through it, and it, that shows um, a number of things. But it shows really the what's the progressive nature. Of sanctification. It, uh -huh. it, we grow in Christ-likeness through the entirety of our lives until we die and we see Jesus face to face and our souls are perfected instantaneously at that point. Um, but, you know, it's, um, I admire the fact that you're willing to, to be transparent and vulnerable and open up an area of your life that I know that there is a bit of fear and trepidation, but mm -hmm. that really shows to me that, that your heart, uh, for God and for people who are uh, sincere in their longing for spiritual reality, and but how easily we can, all of us uh, can, none of us are above being um, misled, mm -hmm. and we it really does take discernment. So, I, I just want to thank you for sharing that very powerful. Um, personal example of, of falling into, um, you know, a practice that, mm -hmm. that that led you astray. Mm -hmm. That took courage. And if we were to be honest, all of us, all of us fall mm -hmm. every day and, and in our own different ways. But I know that you can now um, have common ground with and and have the one thing I noticed about you is just this winsomeness and and compassion 
and empathy with people who are caught up in these sort of things that is uh, is just really beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I know it comes in part from your your own past experience. So thank you for, for being so vulnerable. Oh, thanks, Mark, for saying that. Because, yeah, I suppose that we all have pride and, and that, it's probably the pride in us that, that gets disgusted when we have been deceived because we think, oh, I didn't think I could be deceived by that. Um, <laughs> I suppose mm. that is a part of us that, that is the pride there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my goodness, people can be deceived by anything. Um, and, and you know, I had some friends who had been through similar and they actually got deliverance too. They were born again Christians. They, they had healing ministries and so on. But because of this uh, demonic... Um, stuff they did need deliverance and those demons were cast out them and, and God is gracious as you say um, part of our sanctification process we do make mistakes at times so you know I'm just so um, humbled that he allowed me to see that really and to experience it so that I can identify with others and I know the the, yeah. the addictive feeling of it, I know the exciting feeling of it and the, the, the hoping that it's true and and wanting to uh, to go along with it, but I also know um, how how dangerous it really is. Um, and I think that he used all of our journey, even our seasons of deception, too. Um, you know, to 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 help others. Uh, obviously, folks in the Bible went through various things that they repented of, and then they could help other people. Yeah, exactly. That's it's our broken broken spots. I heard one person say that if you're looking for your your ministry, just look for your broken spot. And you know, for you and for me both, is there are broken spots in this area, and that at the very least can sensitize us to the like you said the addictive nature of it, and not. Hopefully not come across, because we certainly don't want to, as being all-knowing or, or mm-hmm. judgmental. It's mm-hmm. just a fine line between when the Bible speaks clearly about something. Um, it's not it's not humility to, to waffle uh, on it or just say, well, it, that's just my opinion. Um, no, when when God's very clear that trying to communicate with the dead or with the angels is wrong, mm-hmm. we can say gently but firmly, "You, this is wrong," mm-hmm. and if you do it, you will get burned, and it does displease God. And we can say that with utter certainty, without being arrogant, because we want to see all of reality through God's eyes, and. When we know that God's word speaks specifically specifically to an area, then we can speak with humility, but with utter confidence. Mm-hmm. Thus saith the Lord, you know, um, here I stand. And um, I think as well it's because it's an area that, that is so uh, demonic. You know, in the Christian life, we already know there is spiritual warfare. We know we have an enemy, Satan and demons. We know that to expect that throughout our life. So... Why add more to it by inviting extra demons into our life, you know, that that will basically pollute us spiritually, whether we realise it or not. That is the the sad, sad thing. Um, And, and, you know, it can, as you've said before in programmes, become addictive, these types of things. And really, I began to see that what was happening there was... I'm not saying these Christians were not listening to the Holy Spirit or Jesus. I'm not saying that at all. They loved Jesus. I know they did. But I believe with these types of classes, there can become an over-dependence on uh, their angel. Um, Whereas really the Holy Spirit wants us to to be dependent on him. Uh, He's the one we should be going to every day, not asking our angel every day, uh, you know, what to do. It's we have the Bible. The we have the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, we we have we have God's Word, and we have the Holy Spirit to to to, to guide us. And you know, Proverbs three, five, and six. Mm-hmm. Six. 
trust in the Lord uh, with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight, uh, and He will guide us in all our ways. That's why you know, this fascination with angels and looking to them and, and initiating. Um, God, of course, God protects us, um, but He's already communicated to us His will through His Word. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit, God Himself, is poured out love into our hearts. And so it, it really grieves angels uh, that, that we would put so much attention on them. They actually are our servants, and they are not going to, like you said, become over-familiar. So the, this, you know, whether it's on the continent, uh, in, in America, America, wherever is this um, exploding fascination with the angels, it's something I get. I get it, and I know you get it. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just something that we we are trying to to warn, gently warn people, mm -hmm. people about the dangers of it. That that's our point uh, about this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, um, and you know uh, the the woman I mentioned earlier, Carolyn Hamlet, ex Illuminati member. She, uh, you know, got deceived by it as well, although she came out of it very quickly. She saw it quickly. She huh. um, and her friend Lauren have written a book recently that, that they have made it free. It's an entirely free book um, available on uh, Carolyn Hamlet's website. Wow. And um, I think it's called Christian Witchcraft, something like that. I've not read the book myself yet, but uh, I know a little of, of her experience and if she is listening i do apologize for um quoting her earlier without asking her permission um i just it just came out the top of my head um probably i should have asked her first about that experience um but yeah and really you know so i think people who uh, whether it's an angel whether it's uh whether they think it's a, a ghost whether they think it's a spirit guide whatever they think it is and you know, if, if you go along with that for 20, 30 years, all the time thinking it, it, it's, it's, it's good, you may never find out, you know, that it's been a demon. But if you finally do, great, you have time to repent and get out of that and cast it out. But think of what, say it takes you 30 years to discover, oh my goodness, this has actually been a demon. What has that done to you? Wow. All those 30 that years, what has that done to your body, your soul and your mind? What curses has it brought into you? What spiritual pollution? What has it maybe done to your family? You know, people yeah. talk about, people talk yeah. about, oh, I just seem to have bad luck all the time. For all you know, this so-called angel um, has been telling you good news when actual fact it's been causing trouble in the workplace for you, causing trouble in your family life, causing uh, all sorts of illnesses that may develop. Who knows? Um, it, it's a serious spiritual pollution. That's a, that's a great way to put it, spiritual pollution. Uh, that's why I use the astrological analogy of, of what this is like. Because once again, it's you know, we're looking to part of God's creation for guidance and protection when he is very... God is a jealous God. His name is jealous. And he his jealousy is unlike ours. It's perfect and loving and holy. But he... Uh -huh. or less jealous for our singular attention towards him and he doesn't want us doesn't want us to divert it to astrology he doesn't want us to divert our attention to angels or any other part of his uh, his creation he wants us to seek him mm -hmm. moment by moment mm -hmm. and I too know of uh, people who have been involved in deliverance ministry who claim that when they do do a case that they look to their favorite angel and in fact this one girl said that she had michael with her on every case uh, and i'm thinking to myself michael can only be a place one one place at one time yes exactly um and out of all the angels and so we have all these people who claim to have michael on there uh mm -hmm. so i've heard that too yeah and i think michael's probably got more i, I don't mean this uh to be insulting, but I think he probably has far more important things to do than than um, help with deliverance cases. Um, I don't mean to sound uh, nasty by saying that. Yeah, and, and you know, right. it, it's... He in the Old Testament and New Testament is seen as, you're incapable of that. You know that? <laughs> you're incapable of coming across like that. 
So, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. You know, yeah, because, you know, God wants us to develop our sensitivity to following the Holy Spirit and drawing yeah. closer to Jesus. That's what he wants rather than, you know, developing our sensitivity to what an angel might be saying to us today. Um, well. And really, I think it boils down to, is, is Jesus Christ not enough for you? Oh, good way to put it. You know, and, and remember, I'm saying this, having been involved myself, so I'm not trying to be judgmental here. This was one of the thoughts that came into my head when I was coming out of this type of thing. Is Jesus Christ not enough for me? Is the Bible not enough for me? Is the Holy Spirit not enough for me that I need to be wanting oh. to talk to angels as well? And you well, know, that's, that's it in a nutshell, Laura. Yeah. If, wow. if yeah. I really knew him and wanted to know him deeper and be with him and my love for him is, is so he's become my all in all he's become my treasure if you fall in love with him more and more um, you will be so enraptured by him that, that you'll just want to spend your time with him you won't even want to be uh, hoping that an angel visits you Amen Exactly He is your reward He is your um, all in all He is all you need Yeah um, in that intimate place with him. Uh, and I think sometimes these angel exercises and so on, it's like an easy way to get some fast results because, let's face it, they always work, these exercises. Um, well, that's, that's, you know, that, that is the sinful desire going all the way back to the garden is a desire for an immediate supernatural experience. You know, mm -hmm. that there's a real uh, electrical attraction to that, Laura, um, the immediacy of a supernatural experience. It's, it's, it's a real turn on, it's like it's, it's addictive as we talked about, but it's, it's really, it's a real rush. Um, and, you know, frankly, for me, there are many times where the Christian life is just simply slogging on. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't mm -hmm. feel well at times. Um, whether it has to do with again not, not getting enough sleep or just to have a lot on my mind or whatever, but you know I'm just saying what Scripture says is there there is a fair amount of slogging in the Christian life where we just press on mm -hmm. because we know we know what God's word is and we have His Holy Spirit in us and, and frequently it says you know it's in our weakness that God will reveal His strength. Mm -hmm. But we want you know and I put myself in this too. You know, I can easily see how I could want to have this because the struggle with my own weakness, would it be physical, emotional, psychological, is is you know to want to have this immediate supernatural experience that would be a high. Mm -hmm. But we you know the Bible says to love God with all of our heart, soul strength and mind and mm -hmm. that includes like our mind we mm -hmm. we love god with all of our mind in large measure by by looking at it and studying scripture with as much intensity as we can to, to find out what pleases him and what does not and uh in this era in which the spirit of the age is revealing itself is that, is that demons are very opportunistic and they will evolve with Whatever is fascinating in the particular uh, era or that particular time, the 80s, it was that little monster. Now it's something else, but it's definitely fascination with angels. So you can better bet that there's going to be a higher percentage of dem demons manifesting as angels now mm -hmm. than there was before. Yep. And you'll have a lot more, ange quote, angelic EVPs coming through. You'll have more people, mm -hmm. EVPs from people trying to communicate from purgatory and hell because that has become the thing. And mm -hmm. people are getting on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Before, it would have been unheard of to think that a person could communicate from hell because of the hellishness of hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've lost. We've lo yes, exactly. Lost a picture of the grandeur of God and as well as the heinousness and horrendousness of sin and, like I said, the hellishness of hell, which is not going to allow anybody to communicate with anyone. Um, you know, so there we are. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, whether it's angel cards, whether it's uh, EVPs or angel classes for, for Christians, the, there is immediate results when these things happen, immediate results, immediate answers given. When the, the Christians ask the angel a question, the answer is given immediately. Now, you know, through the Bible, often followers of God, um, 
didn't always get an answer straight away from God. Sometimes they had to um, just go on with their life, trusting God, looking to him, yeah. fo following him obediently and waiting for uh, their prayer to be answered or their question to be answered. Um, so I think that's another little sign that, that uh, these aren't true angels. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, Mark and I hope to do a show in the future. We'll have a break and have some other guests on because this has now been six weeks, <laughs> <laughs> which really equates to three months um, because they, they get repeated for two weeks each. But we hope to do a show to carry on this topic, but more in the sense of what Mark alluded to there. Um, people, including Christians, who believe they are now talking to people in hell uh, through EVPs and so on. Um, and, and communicating with them. And we would like to share how we feel uh, that is also unbiblical. So we've only got, gosh, like a minute left, Mark. Um, Mark's information, his his articles that he writes can be found on I on the Paranormal website, plus his Facebook page, Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes, the title of his book. Mark, please uh, finish the, the programme in prayer for our dear listeners. I'd be, I'd be delighted to. Um, by the way, I, I want to say, Laura, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this um, unprecedented privilege of being with you these last six weeks. Let, oh, let's pray. Thank you so much. Uh, Heavenly Father, we bow before you in worship, and you are both transcendent and imminent. That is, you are holy, 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 beyond all that we can uh, think or imagine, but you're also so tender and close to us. We pray that you might be honored and glorified through this interview and that you would take our weakness, your strength, and use it for your glory. And for any of those who hear this, who are struggling with these issues, that you would anoint them with the fullness of your Holy Spirit and that you would use this message to touch a maximum number of people for your glory and to reorient them to be delighted, as Laura said, with Christ as their all in all. And that there's no need to look to anyone or anything else and so we pray in Jesus' precious name and praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And God bless everyone. And tune in again next time. God bless. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio. Zizek for your life with Eternal Radio. End Time Hour is broadcast only on Eternal Radio, along with a host of other unique and excellent programs. Now Eternal Radio is even easier to listen to. You can do this by simply visiting eternalradio.org.uk. That's eternalradio.org.uk and clicking on the Listen Now link. Alternatively, you can listen in on your phone by downloading the TuneIn app or Eternal Radio's very own dedicated apps for both Android and iPhone. It's also possible to tune in on a variety of other platforms including Amazon's Fire TV. Also, if you have any questions for me or for other Eternal Radio hosts, please email us at onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk That's onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk